Chapter 17, Ascent of the Great Peak of Cameroons. Setting forth how the voyager is minded to ascend the mountain called Mungo Malobe, or the Throne of Thunder, and in due course reaches Wea, situated thereon. After returning from Corsico, I remained a few weeks in Gaboon, and then, then left on the Niger, commanded by Captain Davies. My regrets, I should say, arose from leaving the charms and interests of Congo Francais, and had nothing, nothing whatever to do with taking passage on one of the most comfortable ships of all those which call on the coast. The Niger was homeward bound when I joined her, and in due course arrived in, in Cameroon River, and I was once again under the dominion of Germany. I, it would be a very interesting thing to compare the various forms of European government in Africa, English, French, German, Portuguese, and Spanish, but to do so with any justice would occupy more space than I have at my disposal, for the subject is extremely intricate. Each of these forms of governance, government have their good points and their bad. Each of them are dealing with bits of Africa differing from each other in the nature of their inhabitants and their formation, and so on. So I will not enter into any comparison of them here. From the deck of the Niger, I found myself again confronted with my great temptation, the magnificent Mungo Ma, Ma Lob, the thunder of thro throne of thunder. Now it is none of my business to go up mountains. There's next to no fish on them in West Africa, and precious little good rank fetish, and as population on them is sparse, the African, like myself, abhorring cool, cool air. Nevertheless, I feel quite sure that no white man has ever looked on the great peak of Cameroon without a desire arising in his mind to ascend it, and know in detail the highest point on the western side of the continent, and indeed one of the highest points in all Africa. So great is the majesty and charm of this mountain that the temptation of it is as great to me today as it was on the first day I saw it, when I was feeling my way down the west coast of Africa on the SS Lagos in 1893, and it revealed itself by good chance from its surface wash plinth to its skyscraping summit. Certainly it is most striking when you see it first, as I first saw it after coasting for weeks along the low shores and mangrove-fringed rivers of the Niger Delta. Suddenly, right up out of the sea, rises the great mountain to its 13,750, 760 feet, while close at hand, to westward, towers the lovely island mass of Fernando Po to 10,190 feet. But every time you pass it by its beauty, by, by every time you pass it by, its beauty grows on you with greater and greater force, though it is never twice the same. Sometimes it is wreathed with indigo black tornado clouds, sometimes crusted with snow, sometimes softly gorgeous with gold, green, and rose colored vapors tinted by the setting sun, sometimes completely swathed in dense clouds so that you cannot see it at all. But when you once know it is there, it is all the same, and you bow down and worship. There are only two distinct peaks to this glorious thing that geologists brutally call the volcanic intrusive mass of the Cameroon Mountains, viz. Big Cameroon and Little Cameroon. The later, Mungo Ma Endete, has not yet been scaled, although it is only 5,820 feet. One reason for this is doubtless that few people in the fever-stricken, overworked West Africa who are able to go up mountains naturally try for the adjacent Big Cameroon. The other reason is that Mungo Ba Etada, Etode, it to which Burton refers as the most, as the awful form of Little Cameroon, is mostly sheer cliff and is from foot to summit clothed in an almost impenetrable forest. Behind these two mountains of volcanic origin, which cover an area on an isolated base of between 700 and 800 square miles in extent, there are distinctly visible from the coast two chains of mountains, or I should think one chain deflected, the so-called Rumbi and Oman ranges. These are no relation to of no relations of Mungo, being a very different structure and confirmation 
con con conformation. The geological specimens I have brought from them and from the Cameroons being identified by geologists as respectively Chateau's grit, Chateau's grit, and vesticular lava. After spending a few pleasant days in Cameroon River in the society of Frau Plenum, my poor friend Mrs. Duggan, having, I regret to say, departed for England on the death of her husband, I went round to Victoria and Bass Bay on the Niger, and, in spite of my of being advised solemnly by Captain Davies to chuck it as it is not it was not a picnic, I started to attempt the peak of Cameroons as follows. September 20th, 1895. Left Victoria at 7.30. Weather fine. Herr von Luke, though sadly convinced by a series of experiments he has been carrying on ever since I landed, and I expect before, that you cannot be in three places at one time, is still trying to do so. Or more properly speaking, he starts an experiment series for four places, Manlike, instead of getting ill, as I should under the circumstances, and he kindly comes with me as far as the bridge across the lovely cascading Lacole River, and then goes back at about seven miles an hour to look after Victoria and his sick subordinates in detail. I, with my crew, keep up on the grand new road the government is making, which, when finished, is to go from Ambas Bay to Boa, 3,000 feet up on the mountain side. This road is quite the most magnificent of roads, as regards breadth, breadth and general intention, that I have seen anywhere in West Africa, and it runs through a superbly beautiful country. It is, I should say, as broad as Oxford Street. On either side of it are deep drains to carry off the surface waters, with banks of varied beautiful tropical shrubs and ferns, behind which rise, a hundred to two hundred feet, walls of grand forest, the column-like tree stems either hung with flowering climbing plants and ferns, or showing soft red and soft gray shafts, sixty to seventy feet high, without an interrupting branch. Behind this, again, rise the lovely footholds of Mungo, high up against the sky, colored the most perfect soft dark blue. The whole scheme of color is indescribably rich and full in tone. The very earth is a velvety red brown, and the butterflies, which abound, show themselves off in the sunlight in their canary-colored crimson and peacock blue liveries to perfection. After five minutes' experience of the road, I envy those butterflies. I do not believe there is a more lovely road in this world, and besides, it's a noble and enterprising thing of a government to go and make it, considering the climate and the country. But to get any genuine pleasure out of it, it is requisite to hover in a bird or butterfly-like way, for, of all, the, of all the truly awful things to walk on, that road, when I was on it, was the worst. Of course, this arose from it not being finished, not having its top on, in fact. The bit that was finished, and had, had its, got its top on, for half a mile beyond the bridge, you could go over in a bath chair. The rest of it made you fit for one of those the rest of your natural life, for it was one mass of broken lava rock and here and there leviathan tree stumps that had been partially blown up with gunpowder. <laughs>